It's good to see those who are gathered here in this place. It's good to uh, have those who are online today as we participate in worship together. Let's begin this time of worship with prayer. O oh, loving God, we thank you for this day that you have made, a day that is a gift from you. We thank you for your presence among us as we worship you in body and in spirit, that you would move among us, that your spirit would dwell among us, and would form us more fully into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Welcome to Mount Zion United Methodist Church. Uh, it's good to have you here today on this cool and rainy morning. Uh, welcome to all those jo joining us online. I have a, uh, a few things in the bulletin to draw your attention to. One is we have a United Methodist Women's virtual meeting this Wednesday, February 3rd at 2.30. So the Zoom information is found in your bulletin. Uh, so all UMW members are encouraged to, to join that meeting. Um, also, in partnership with Lawrence Chapel United Methodist Church, uh, we're putting together an upper room style daily Lenten devotional book, um, and you can submit, submit those if you'd like to be a part of that. You can reach out to, to Pastor Jonathan, but the information is there in the bulletin. Uh, one final announcement, the children and youth of the church will have a Valentine's Day party February 14th at 2 o'clock. That will be on Zoom and a treat and a craft will be delivered to your house. So please uh, let us know if you plan to, to do that. You can let Pastor Jonathan know or Zechariah know and um, that you, that you want to have that delivered to your house if you want to join in. Any other announcements? Okay, please join me in your bulletin for the prayer of confession. Oh God, before Jesus began his earthly ministry, he went out into the wilderness to prepare himself for what was to come. Far too often, we confess, we expect results without putting in the preparation. We expect to hear from you without ever opening our Bibles or listening for your voice in community with others. We expect to grow in our discipleship accidentally without intention on our part. Even though Jesus was divine, he still needed to take steps to prepare for what you set before him. Help all of us who bear his name to do the same. Amen. And now join me for the responsive reading found in your bulletin. I'll read the regular print and you respond in bold. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Let none that wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are clothed with treachery. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore the Lord instructs sinners in the way and leads the humble in what is right and teaches them their way. All who ask the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep the Lord's covenant and justice. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we reaffirm our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we move into a time of prayer together, I just want to uh, remind folks watching online to go on and share prayer requests that you might have because there is a little delay so we can make sure to include those prayer requests out loud with all who are gathered here in the sanctuary. I know um, of a few prayer needs that have been shared with me. One um, is that we've had on our prayer list for the last few weeks uh, the name of Don Alexander. He uh, was the pastor at Luann Martin's home church um, upstate, and um, he passed away uh, this week after a uh, several-week battle with, with COVID. And so we want to remember um, Don's family and that church family and, and that community because I also understand there are several others in that community who also have passed away just within this past week um, from COVID. And so we want to remember uh, the family of Don Alexander and that community. 
I also want to lift up um, Ashley Gelder uh, shared on here, and I've lost where it is on our feed, but um, that the little girl, Audrey, who we've been praying for, who, who is also on our prayer list, who's been dealing with seizures, she has surgery, I believe it said this Tuesday. And so we want to remember um, Audrey as she goes through that and her family. It sounds like the doctors are not sure if that surgery is going to solve all of the problems she's having. And so just prayers that, um, that Audrey will prove them wrong and that it will make um, a difference with all that she's been dealing with. Um, Connie mentions in the chat <laughs> that uh, Neil Pincher's surgery went well. And so we'll remember Remember him and prayers for continued healing with that. Are there any other prayer needs that we have to share with one another today? Absolutely. Uh, so a prayer for change. Um, Jill Sims mentions that she'll be having knee surgery on Wednesday, and prayers are appreciated for that. So we lift up Jill. Are there other prayers or praises? If not, let's join our hearts in a time of prayer together. Loving God, we thank you that no matter what is going on in our lives, that you are aware, that you care, and that you hear us when we share what it is that we carry. God, we thank you for your presence in our midst. We thank you for... Um, modern medicine and for the knowledge that, uh, that you have allowed people to have and, and to develop so that we can um, more, more effectively do your healing work. Um, God, we lift up um, those who will be having surgery this week for, for Jill and, and for Audrey and uh, for others. We ask that you would just allow those physicians and nurses and, and all those who have a hand in that to be your hands and feet, to do your healing work because you are the great physician. God, we recognize that there are so many ways that we need healing. We ask that you would bring peace to those who need it. We ask that you would bring comfort to those who grieve the loss of loved ones. We ask that you would bring strength and, and patience as many people await changes in life circumstances. Needs are that you would give We thank you for those celebrations we have of surgeries that have gone well and other joys that we rejoice over and ask that you would underneath us, that you would give us energy and strength to continue on this journey of discipleship as we follow your son Jesus. And so we ask that you would now form us by your grace more fully into the image of your son Jesus, in whose name we pray as long ago, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to hear our scripture reading, which comes this morning from Mark chapter 1. And... Um, Abel, please stand as we hear the reading of the gospel. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. 
This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And let us pray. O oh Lord, speak through me or speak in spite of me. But speak, O oh Lord. For we, your children, long to hear a word from you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So friends, a week from today there will be a huge event. It's such an important event that two groups of 53 young men between the ages of 21 and 45 will spend almost every waking moment between now and next Sunday preparing for it. They will be out, uh, probably outside, running around practicing things, practicing moves to get ready for it. They'll spend hours looking at pictures of circles and X's with arrows pointing all different kind of directions and memorizing what they see. They'll spend hours watching and dissecting footage of other grown men playing a children's game. The day before the big event, uh, there will be someone who's in charge of making sure that each group of 53 men has matching outfits that are clean and wrinkle-free. The day of the big event, those young men will make sure that they have plenty of rest. They'll eat a meal specifically designed to give them the fuel that they need to do everything that they need to do. And they'll even put on shoes that were custom made for each of them to help them accomplish what it is they want to accomplish. Now those young men aren't the only ones who are getting ready with, with careful planning and attention to detail for next week's big event. There are also people all over this country, although fewer than in years past, who are figuring out how they're going to get from where they are to Tampa, Florida for next Sunday. Over the next week, many of them will take multiple COVID-19 tests to make sure that it's safe for them to attend. This coming Saturday night, many of them will carefully lay out their color-coordinated outfits the night before to make sure that they don't have to have that done the next day. They'll get up early. Some of them will put makeup on their faces. Some of them will even put makeup on their bellies. And they'll, they'll go out and they'll, they'll load up all kinds of food and non-alcoholic beverages into these big coolers. <laughs> into their coolers. And they'll hop in their cars and they'll go to the parking lot outside of this big, almost cathedral. And they'll sit out there for hours to make sure that they are there on time. And then when the time for the big event nears, they'll get into a very long socially distanced line and probably wait for hours for their chance to trek up or down about a hundred of the steepest stairs known to humankind before they find a little two, in, two, two foot wide square that they'll get to sit on for the next four to five hours. Now why would people spend every moment of this upcoming week and really for the past four or five months and really for their whole lives preparing to run around on a field next week why would 22,000 people invest so much of their time and resources and energy planning how they're going to get from where they are to what's happening next sunday well it's because you don't get to the super bowl by accident you don't get to the Super Bowl by accident. You only get there with lots and lots of careful, careful planning and preparation. Now last week we heard about how Jesus, before he began his life-changing and world-changing ministry, that he was first baptized, an important moment when God reminded him who he most truly was. Not just the son of Mary and Joseph, not just a foreigner or an outsider, not just a teacher, not just a criminal but rather, ultimately, most deep down, more than anything else, a beloved child of God in whom God was well pleased. Before he could go out and do all the healing and magnificent work that Jesus did, he first had to remember who he was. Well, before he could go out and do that work, he also had one more thing he needed to do. He had to intentionally prepare. And there's a lot of stuff that Jesus had to prepare for. For one, there were a lot of challenges that awaited him. 
when he began his ministry. He was going to be tempted three times by Satan. He was going to have Pharisees and Herodians who from almost the very beginning of his ministry were going to be trying to figure out how to kill him. There were people who questioned his authority. He was uh, betrayed. He was accused of being a lunatic and, and, and having a demon. He was going to be arrested and mocked and, and, and beaten. He would be um, denied by one of his best friends. He would ultimately be killed. Jesus faced the kinds of challenges that you don't endure without first preparing for them. Jesus' life, of course, was not just about handling tough things that we wouldn't want to go through. He also did a lot of things that brought joy. He, he demonstrated love and taught and, and brought healing and, and bestowed grace on people in powerful ways. He healed the sick. He calmed storms. He brought the dead to life. He fed thousands of people. He, he gave purpose and meaning not only to fishermen and tax collectors, but also to every single one of us today. He did the good and important and difficult work of bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, a task that you don't accomplish if your energy reserves are empty, if you aren't full of God's grace. If he was going to inaugurate God's kingdom, then it wasn't just going to happen by accident. He had to prepare. He had to make sure that he was filled with everything that he needed in order to accomplish what was set before him by God. And that's why as soon as he'd been told who he was, the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to get ready for what was to come. Before being tempted three times, before facing the trials that he faced throughout his ministry, before attempting to do what he had been called to do, he first spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness. Now I'm going to pause here to say that fasting is something that has never sounded appealing to me. For basically my whole life, I've pretty much been skin and bones. Part of the reason I wear a robe on Sundays is so you can't see how scrawny I am. <laughs> fasting, going without a meal, has never sounded like something that would be fun for me. And so based on my own experience, Jesus fasting for 40 days in the wilderness sounds like Jesus putting himself through something incredibly miserable that would drain his energy and would hinder his ability to do what God called him to do, not help. And so it's important to remember that when Jesus fasted and, and when many Christians since Jesus have fasted throughout the years, fasting has not been about doing without something for the sake of doing without something. Fasting has always been, in its, most, in its truest form, about doing without something so that in that newfound space, we have room to add in something that draws us nearer to God. It's easy to imagine that for 40 days, Jesus replaced some of the time that he would have used to eat by instead praying, by listening to the voice of God, by being drawn more fully into who God called him to be through prayer, rather than just stuffing his face time and time again. Drawing on the longer version of the story that's found in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we can pretty easily imagine that Jesus used some of that time when he was fasting, and rather than eating, to study scripture and to learn scripture so that he would have the words that he needed when they were called upon. Um, in Matthew and Luke, you have Satan quoting scripture, and Jesus has to know <laughs> scripture in order to, to answer back. He spent time praying. He spent time learning scripture. He spent his time fasting not to see how much he could empty himself just for the sake of emptying himself, but rather emptying himself so that he could be filled to the brim by things that would draw him nearer to God and help him to grow more fully into the person he needed to be for what he was about to face. Like those football players who intentionally have spent months and years building up their bodies and, and, and filling their minds with knowledge so that they can go out on a football field next week and execute plays and, and win a championship. Like Jesus, who spent 40 days intentionally building himself up spiritually in preparation for upcoming challenges and opportunities, we will not fully become the people God knows we can be by accident. Yes, God pours out grace upon grace, but God also calls us to respond. God gives us hearts and minds to, to think through how we're going to intentionally become the people 
God knows we can become for the things that God has entrusted us to do. We won't grow fully into the image of Christ without intention. We won't grow fully into the church God knows we can be and calls us to be without intention. Like those football players who will run around on our TV screens a week from today, and like Jesus Christ himself, who will become who we need to be only with intentional preparation. Now, I know most of you know, uh, know what I'm about to say already because there's a football team just down the road that uh, many of you, or at least a few of you, uh, keep up with. Some of you even go to their games. Um, but So you know that before a big football game, or a, before any football game, even if it's not a big football game, that one of the first things a team does is they make a game plan. Their coaches get together, they get the team together, and they say, here's what we need to do step by step in order to get the goal, achieve the goal that we want to achieve, probably winning the game. And so I want to ask you as a follower of Christ, what is your game plan for becoming the person God knows and calls you to become? What are you intentionally taking out of your life, like Jesus, or adding into your life in order to grow a little more closely day by day into something that looks and talks and acts more like Jesus than the day before? Now I'm going to give you two examples of my game plan, one thing that I do well, and one thing that needs improvement. A few years ago, I read a book by a really phenomenal United Methodist pastor named Joe Daniels. He does a lot of amazing work at the church he pastors uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. And one of the things he talked about in that book was how every week he's blocked out this time where he spends it with a prayer partner of his. They call each other, they pray together every week. He will not schedule a meeting during that time. He will not let anybody else schedule a meeting for him during that time. He will not respond to an emergency <laughs> during that time. Because he knows that in order to have the strength that he needs to be spiritually grounded as he needs to be, to achieve some of the God-sized visions that God has given him, then he needs to guard that time like his life depends on it, because it does. So I read that in a book. Not long after that, I went to a, a gathering of about 20 other young United Methodist pastors um, in Washington, D.C., and we met Joe Daniels. And he talked about, more than anything else, not the, uh, not the low-cost housing that his congregation had raised money for uh, to alleviate homelessness in that area, but rather about the importance of having somebody to pray with on a regular basis for mutual encouragement and accountability in order to grow fully into who God had called him to be. Well, after that, about a year and a half later, I went to a denomination-wide gathering that had speakers from all over the place. And guess who one of the speakers was? Joe Daniels. And guess what he talked about? <laughs> the need to have someone to pray with on a regular basis for mutual encouragement and accountability and growth. Well, at that point, I figured that's one time for the Father, one for the Holy for the Son and one for the Holy Spirit. So maybe God's trying to tell me something. So I picked up the phone and I called a dear friend of mine from seminary, the Reverend Jay Song, who uh, was a guest preacher here virtually over the summer one Sunday. And I said, Jay, how about we start praying for each other every week? And so since then, for about a little over three years now, every Friday morning, you will not be able to get a hold of me because we're on the phone with each other, praying with and for one another holding each other accountable for our ongoing growth. We're both, we're both preachers, and so sometimes I will tell him, you know what, I feel like God's calling me to, to maybe preach on this thing that people might find controversial. And my inclination is to say, no, I'm not going to touch that with a 22 and a half foot pole. Um, I'm just going to play it safe and, and kind of keep the peace, keep everybody happy. And I know that the next Friday, Jay is going to ask me, so how did you follow where God was leading you rather than chickening out <laughs> and playing it safe? We hold each other accountable. Part of my game plan right now is that time with another brother in Christ, praying with and for one another and holding each other accountable for growth. Now, I do well with that, but I'll tell you something that I don't do well with that I'm trying to add to my game plan. I have here, it just happens, I have a great prop, my phone. You may love your phone, I love my phone. Um, it does all kinds of things that Alexander Graham Bell never dreamed that a phone would be able to do. 
There are things that I can do um, that help my ministry so much because of this little device. But even though this thing is not shaped like a toilet, it's amazing how much time I have flushed down this thing since I've had it. Um, an example, there's uh, on my phone, if I had it on, if it was big enough for you to see, um, there's this little blue circle with a white F in the middle of it. And sometimes I will think, oh, I have a notification. Somebody has uh, liked something on the church's Facebook page or somebody has a birthday. And I'll think I'm just going to be on there for like 30 seconds. So I'll press the button. And inevitably, before I know it, I've looked at about 100 pictures of Bernie Sanders and his mittens <laughs> everywhere in the world. I've gotten disappointed at at least one person I know and love for sharing a, uh, a misleading meme that they should know better than to share. I have been confused by numerous references uh, to a video game store that I thought had closed 20 years ago that apparently hasn't because people are still buying stock in it. And otherwise, I have squandered 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes of my life that I can never get back. Now, I will tell you that there has not been a single time, I think, when I have finally closed out of Facebook and I've said, man, my life is so much better off for having just done that. Usually, at best, I feel a little bit of shame that I just squandered time that I could have used to accomplish something or, or to spend with people I love. At worst, I'm frustrated and angry <laughs> by the many things I have read on there. And so part of my game plan that I'm working on adding to my own spiritual walk is that anytime I get the inclination to press on that alluring blue circle with the white F on it, I will instead click on the Bible app and pick up reading with wherever I left off the last time, probably 15 minutes before. Now how about you? What is your game plan? For growing as a follower of Christ, for intentionally preparing to become the person God calls you to be. Because like you and like, like, like me, you're not going to make those changes if you don't plan for how they're going to happen. If you don't have a game plan, what's the first step you can take to begin developing one? What's one thing you can let go of to create room for prayer and scripture reading? What's one thing you can do to ensure that your life is more deeply formed by this book than by Facebook? More, more deeply formed by the good news than Fox News or CNN News? Maybe it means reaching out to someone like I did three and a half years ago and saying, when can we pray with each other this week and hold each other accountable for our ongoing growth as followers of Christ? I would highly recommend it. It's made a huge difference in my life. Maybe it means keeping track for a week of how much time you spend on social media and on TV rather than on prayer and scripture reading. And then develop a plan for how you will bring those amounts of time into better alignment that reflect the priorities that you wish you had. Maybe it means participating in small group fellowship and, and Bible study. Not only so that you'll be blessed by the perspectives of other followers of Christ, but also to benefit from the encouragement and the accountability that come from not doing this by yourself. I was thinking this past week about how if you and I had already accomplished everything for the sake of the kingdom of God that God wanted us to accomplish, then not a single one of us would be here. If we'd already done all of the work that Christ calls us to accomplish for the sake of God's kingdom, then we would not still be here. We would be done. And since we're still here, that means that God still calls us each to grow more fully into the image of Jesus Christ so that we might be prepared for whatever work it is that Christ still has for us to do, no matter how big or small. Friends, what God has entrusted to us, the, the, the work of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, is far more important than a football game that will be over about a week and 12 hours from now, no matter who you're pulling for. The work God has given to us is more important than that. If so much preparation and intention would go into an event that ha will have a result that most of us will have forgotten within a few weeks from now, then how much does the calling that God has given us 
require of us intention and planning so that we might accomplish what God has called us to do and to be. Disciples of Jesus Christ, who make disciples of Jesus Christ, so that this world will be transformed more into what God knows it can and will ultimately become. May we prepare, may we have intention, so that we might be the people God has called us to be and do the things that God knows we can do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One of the ways as we seek to become more loving and more like Jesus in our hearts, as that music uh, talks about in the lyrics, um, one of the ways that we grow is by doing things that help us to practice um, love and generosity towards others. And so in a moment, we'll have the opportunity to, on your way out, give back to God um, by placing uh, your offering, whatever God calls you to give in the offering box by the door on your way out. If you're watching online, you have the opportunity um, to use this time um, to also give your offerings online. Um, but however God calls us to give, God invites us to become more loving and more generous by practicing generosity towards others. And so let's pray, and then we'll have our benediction and be sent forth. Loving God, we thank you for the many gifts you have given to us. We thank you for the opportunities we have 
to give back to you and to practice in, in our lives generosity and love, compassion in ways that help us become more loving and generous and compassionate. And so we ask that you would bless what we give back to your service, that you would uh, use it to further your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, that you would use it to form us more fully into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, and all that we say and do, and that by our generosity, which is possible because you have first been generous to us, uh, that you would touch the lives of others with your love, your grace, and your compassion. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, go forth from this place with the confidence that comes with knowing that Christ goes with you, that the Holy Spirit dwells within you, and that no matter what God calls you to do, that God allows you to have a game plan to get there by study, by prayer, and by being aware of Christ's presence in your life that calls you to do great things in his name. Go in peace.